Just while we're waiting for everyone to sit down, go ahead and turn off your cell phones um, if you haven't already. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming to the MIT Center for International Studies Star Forum. Tonight's talk on health care policy is one in a series of discussions on advice to the next president on pressing policy issues. We're delighted to have with us this evening noted health care expert and MIT professor of economics, Jonathan Gruber. Professor Gruber served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Treasury Department from 1997 to 98. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2005 and in 2006 received the American Society of Health Economists inaugural medal for best health economist in the nation aged 40 and under. He was appointed in 2006 to the board of the Massachusetts Insurance Connector, the state's ambitious health care reform effort, and was named the 19th most powerful person in health care in the United States by Modern Healthcare Magazine. Just this year, he was elected to the American Academy, excuse me, Academy of Arts and Sciences. Tonight, Professor Gruber will help elucidate the health care policies of John McCain and Barack Obama. Both candidates promise tax cuts, new programs, and other goodies, but we only get the sound bites. Many of us haven't a clue to what's crippling our system, the cure, or why, for example, the quality of care in America ranks last on most measures of performance when compared to other advanced nations. Just a few things that we hope Professor Gruber will help explain. The talk will be concluded with a Q&A from the audience, and since we're taping the event, we just ask that you come down and speak into the mic for the questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to give a relatively brief talk and leave more time than your Q&A because it's hard to know, uh, you know if I'm telling too much or not. I'm reminded of this famous story from my family about when my sister came running up to my father and said, Dad, Dad, where's Mom? I need her. And he said, she's not here. Why? She said, I need help with my math homework. Well, my father has a PhD in finance, so he was a bit upset that she felt he need, my daughter, uh, his, his daughter needed, uh, needed his wife for help. He said, well, why can't I help you? And she said, because I don't want to know that much about it. <laughs> so um, the, I, I want to try to avoid telling you more than you want to know about it. I'd rather hear the questions that you have. So I'm going to talk briefly uh, tonight about what I call incremental universalism. I think there's a real consensus building in this country for where we need to go with health care reform. It's driven in large part by what we've done here in Massachusetts. So I want to talk about that and then uh, talk in that context about um, the contrast between what the uh, candidates are proposing and then turn to your questions. Let me start by setting the stage by thinking about universal coverage. Let me just say right off the bat, my talk is going to be 95% about health care coverage and 5% about health care costs, and I'll tell you why later. But we have these twin crises in America. We have 47 million people without health care insurance. That's 47 million people who are a car accident away from being bankrupted. Okay? And we have spiraling and incredibly high health care costs. I'm going to focus on the former mostly in this talk. And I want to talk about moving to universal coverage, solving the problem, really the moral imperative, I view, of making sure that everyone in America has health insurance coverage, can't be bankrupted by an adverse medical event. Uh, and moving to join the League of Other Industrialized Nations, all of which have universal health care coverage. If we're going to do this, we really only have to address three issues. Every health care reform plan you can think of can be categorized into just how it deals with three issues. The first issue is pooling. Basically, most people in America are happy with their health insurance because they get it from large employers who can buy health insurance at actually fair prices and offer people a wide range of choices. However, for people who work in small firms, and especially for people who aren't offered employer-sponsored insurance, health insurance markets in America are failing. People have to then go to the small group market, or even worse, the non-group market, which in most states uh, is a complete unregulated nightmare. Uh, we know about the hazards of unregulated markets, especially these days, and this is a perfect example of what can happen. In most states, if you try to buy health insurance on your own and you're sick, they can turn you down. Or states will sometimes pass laws saying they can't turn you down, so they'll say, yes, you can have health insurance, it'll be a million dollars a month, because there's no state, there's no regulation stopping them from doing that. So in most non-group non markets, health insurance is unaffordable or even unavailable 
if, uh, if you're sick. That's not insurance. So uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to solve the pooling problem that pervades the non-group insurance markets. We have to get everyone into a pool so that the sick and the healthy pool together, just like they do here at MIT, and that we can get insurance fairly priced for everyone uh, rather than leaving the sick without access to health insurance, as they are in many circumstances. The second problem is affordability. The cost of a typical family health insurance policy, about $12,000 a year, is more than half of family income for those, below, for those at the U.S. poverty line, about $20,000 a year. And it's, more than 20%, it's about more than 20% of income, even for people at median income in the U.S. So for the typical family in the U.S., if they had to buy health insurance on their own, it would cost them more than 20% of their income. It's simply infeasible to expect the lower half of the income distribution in America to pay these costs without any government support. So the second issue we have to address is affordability. And the final issue we have to address is mandates, which is it is impossible to get even close to universal health care coverage in America without mandating that everyone buy health insurance or just providing as a free entitlement. Okay? And that's a fact we're going to have to deal with as we evaluate different plans. Now, with that stage set, let's think about where the debate has been over the past really several decades. The debate's been stuck between the extremes on the left and the right. Where's the left been? The left has said, look, let's have a single-payer system. In fact, 10 years ago, single-payer and universal coverage were sort of synonymous with each other. The point of my talk is they don't have to be. Okay? A single-payer system is a particular approach to solving the three problems I just laid out. It solves the pool problem because that, the pool is the biggest pool possible. It's the entire nation. Everyone buys health insurance at actuarially fair prices because we're all pooled together. It solves the affordability problem because it's a free entitlement upon birth. Everybody gets health insurance for free. Just pay for, you know, pay for out of the general revenues, but for the marginal individual, it's free health insurance. And then finally, it solves the mandate problem because it's default entitlement for everyone. Everyone has health insurance as a right of being a citizen, uh, say, of Canada. So this approach has a lot of appeal, but really faces three, in my view, deadly problems. These problems are sort of in reducing order of importance to economists, but increasing order of importance to politicians. The most important issue for an economist and the least important for a politician is that a national system like that reduces the potential for innovation. Insurers have been innovating in many interesting ways in the U.S. over the past couple of decades. It's not clear on net it's a good thing compared to other things they're doing, but nonetheless, there are innovative practices that are being undertaken by insurers uh, that might get lost if there's one government-provided insurance program, and that's a potential cost. The second potential cost uh, that's probably a bit less important to economists but starting to get more important to politicians is that this doesn't meet the need of most consumers. Most cons there's a huge diversity of views out there on what people want from their health insurance, so one federal health insurance plan will not meet their needs. And then probably least important for economists but most important for politicians is this would involve nationalizing a $500 billion a year plus industry. It's not going to happen. I don't think any of us should spend any of our time thinking about single-payer systems. It is just not going to happen. Okay? It's a pipe dream, and we, we spend way too long looking at Canada. Canada is not going to happen in the U.S., and I think that we need to shift our focus elsewhere. Now, on the right, they've said, okay, what should we do? Well, let's offer tax credits to people to buy health insurance. So what the, let's offer people money to offset the cost of buying their non-group insurance. Now, this, if large enough, these credits address the affordability issue, and they're much more politically feasible. However, they have fatal flaws. First of all, half the uninsured don't pay taxes. It's kind of hard to use the tax system to go after them. Second of all, there's no pooling mechanism. So if I'm sick and not offered health insurance, uh, a price of infinity is still a price of infinity, even with a tax credit. Okay? So it's not going to help the sick person who can't get access to health insurance. And then finally, estimates such as my own suggest there's really only going to be modest coverage increases at realistic levels. So in some sense, I view this, the analogy I like to think of is think about there being a sea of medical risk. And think about in that sea there being this really nice boat. And on that boat is 170 million people with employer-sponsored insurance. And part of the reason that boat's very nice, as I'll come to later, is those people buy their employer-provided insurance with tax-subsidized dollars. They have gold-plated sinks and stuff. They have a very nice boat. Swimming in this ocean are about 47 million people who are at, at risk of drowning at any moment. They're the uninsured. The people in the boat are sort of waving down to them and they feel kind of bad, but, you know, that's the way it goes. What would, what would single-payer advocates have us do? They'd have us march the 170 million people off the boat and put them on a new somewhat rickety boat with the 47 million other people. It's just not going to happen. Things in America which make 170 million people sad to make 47 million people happy 
don't happen. Okay? So that's the problem there. What's the tax credit approach? The tax credit approach is say, let's take some boards and nails and throw them to people in the water and say, okay, build your own boat. Okay? That's not going to happen either. So he's sort of been stuck in the middle. Into this middle marches this new movement that I'm calling incremental universalism. What I mean by that is it's getting to universal coverage, but it's doing so without ripping up the system and starting over. It's doing so incrementally by building on what works, but getting us to universal coverage. And it really is following a model we've pioneered here in Massachusetts. That's just, this is not the first time people have thought about it. It's an idea that had been floating around and it gained a lot of traction about the past decade in health policy circles. But Massachusetts is running the experiment. So let's focus on the Massachusetts plan for a moment. Not that this is the ideal, but it gives you an example of what an incremental universalism approach could look like. Okay, so how does the Massachusetts plan work? It's put, it's put in April 2006, um, it's, and it's been sort of refined over the past couple of years. First of all, um, there's what I call privatized public insurance for people below three times the poverty line. To fix ideas, the poverty line is $10,000 for an individual, about, and $20,000 for a family. Okay? I don't think health reform wouldn't have happened if the poverty line was like $14,000 because it would be harder to multiply by three. Health reform has really happened by the round numbers the poverty level just happened to be at when we did it. So it's a nice round number at 10 and 20,000. And people below, so people below 30,000 who are singles or 60,000 who are families get a choice of four what's called Medicaid managed care organizations. Okay, these organizations which traditionally have offered care just the very lowest income people in Medicaid and now offer, can offer up to three times the poverty line. It's heavily subsidized. In particular, it's free below one and a half times the poverty line. And it's heavily subsidized with subsidies over two-thirds even at three times the poverty line. So it's heavily subsidized. And there's a very generous benefit package. Okay, so basically people are getting very generous insurance at a heavily subsidized rate. This addresses the affordability problem. It also addresses the pooling problem because we created a new pool. So basically for people below three times the poverty line, we solved the problems I've talked about. Okay? or two of the three problems. I haven't gotten to mandates yet. What about above three times the poverty line? Well, here what we did is we said, look, we're going to merge the small group market, which actually worked reasonably well in Massachusetts, with, a, with the nation's worst non-group market. Worst not in the sense that it wasn't fair. In fact, it was very fair. Everyone could get health insurance for the same price. But what happens in Massachusetts is when you pass a law, just stop and think about it, Massachusetts insurers used to be able to charge people whatever they wanted. Then we passed a law which said no, you have to charge sick and healthy the same thing. What do you think happened? Well, if insurers said I have to charge sick and healthy the same thing, I'm going to charge them a fortune to make sure I don't get just the sick taking it up. So while the average cost of a non-group policy in America is about $2,500, it was $8,000 in Massachusetts, and only the very sickest people took it. So the non-group market was really dysfunctional. We merged it with the small group market, sort of in some sense having a small non-group market get sort of cross-subsidized by this bigger small group market into one market where you could, should not charge differently by health, but you could charge differently by age. We set up this thing called the Connector, which is a place where people could go to get their health insurance. It's kind of a, we have a really neat website, ma, mahealthconnector.org. You can actually see how you can shop for health insurance now online uh, to facilitate purchase in this new reform market. And we mandated that every employer in the state with 10 or more employees set up a way for their employees to buy health insurance in free tax dollars. Okay? So that was the second piece. So we set up this, so now have a pool that works above three times poverty. Finally, we have the individual mandate. This was a source of contentious debate. The legislation was astoundingly the vaguest piece of legislation you'll ever see in your life. It simply said there shall be a mandate if health insurance is affordable. And affordability had to be decided by this board I'm on, the Connector Board. We had a contentious debate about this, and this is where we settled. We settled that everyone who subsidized who's eligible for commonwealth care below three times the poverty line, has to buy health insurance. We said, look, you're heavily subsidized. It's affordable. You have to buy it. Everyone above median income in Massachusetts, which is about five times the poverty line, has to buy health insurance. So if you're above about 50K in income, if you're single or 100K if you're a family, you have to buy health insurance. Between three and five times poverty, there was a debate about affordability levels, and we compromised by setting up an income-based schedule so that some people are mandated but about 15% of the uninsured are exempted from the mandate. About 50% of the uninsured, those who are basically people who are exempted are older people in the range between three to five times poverty, where it would have been more than t about 10% or 12% of their income. Those people are exempted from, uh, from the mandate. And the finance it's enforced through a tax penalty, which is now up to $912 a year. Um, you, there's, uh, there's a new tax form. 
uh, that you have to file showing you have health insurance, and if you don't, you pay a tax penalty. Okay, how's this doing so far? How many Massachusetts so far? You know, uh, caveat, I'm totally biased. Okay, so uh, I think it's doing fantastically, uh, and I'll try to address the, the couple of criticisms that have been levied against it, but let me just point out that I'm totally biased. Okay, what's the results? We have 440,000 newly insured people in Massachusetts. A big uncertainty with this law is we weren't actually sure how many uninsured there were going in. The state surveys, the surveys gave different answers. It was somewhere going in, we thought, between 400,000 and 600,000. Clearly it was more than 400,000. That number was clearly wrong. So we've covered somewhere, somewhat over two-thirds of the uninsured are now covered. We don't know how many yet. Okay? Where are they covered? Well, what's interesting, I always point the screen. You can't see that. Uh, what's interesting is you've got about 29% of them are in Commonwealth care for f where it's free, so the below one and a half times poverty line. About 11% are in Commonwealth care paying some premiums, so that's one and a half to three times the poverty line. About 16% are increased enrollment in our public health insurance program, MassHealth. About 32,000 are buying non-group insurance, about half of those through the new connector we set up. And then most strikingly, 160,000 people have taken up employer-sponsored insurance. This is totally stunning. Okay, let me explain why. If, when, if someone had come to me and said, look, we're going to set up a new program, here's how it's going to work. If you're below three times poverty, you can get heavily subsidized health insurance, practically free, but only if you're not offered by your employer, which is how we set it up. So commonwealth care you can only get into if you're not offered by your employer. I would have said, well, the economics of that is simple. I'm going to tell my employer to stop offering me health insurance so I can go get this great deal. Right? We've just said you can get a great deal, practically free if you're not offered health insurance. So I'd expect, I, would, I expected a lot of what we call crowd out, that people would leave the employer sector, go into this heavily subsidized program. Instead, we've gotten crowd in. Employer-sponsored insurance is up. Why is that? It's the mandate. Basically, any Red Sox fans here, if you remember from watching your games last year, the much preferred championship season of 2007, you remember every game in between the first and second innings, there was an ad with the guy who had a broken arm saying, I got it, I got health insurance. Okay, a bunch of people saw that and apparently said, gee, I need health insurance. Okay, they went to their employers and said, my buddies have health insurance, get it from their employers, give me health insurance. And so we actually, in the short run at least, have gotten crowd in, not crowd out, and that's quite striking. Uh, and I think it's been very influential in the Washington debates. Um, through, um, uh, through fall 2007, we cut the uninsured rate in about in half. This, by the way, is before the mandate was even effective. So that's sort of early on in implementation. And what's striking is we reduced the uninsured rate both among poor people who were subsidized and among higher income people who weren't subsidized. So even people who, before the mandate even went into place, for people who weren't even subsidized, now the uninsured rate was low to start. Whoops. The uninsured rate was low to start, but we cut it in about half. That's really quite striking. Um, the Commonwealth Care Program. Here's where the controversy's been. The controversy's been that this program was originally projected in 2009 to cost about $750 million. It's come in now at about, 869 is actually a bit low, it's come in now at about a billion dollars. So the controversy's been that we were about a third off. Okay? Now, I'm kind of defensive about this because the $750 million number was mine. Okay? But, let me actually, but why did this happen? Well, this happened basically not because we got the cost wrong. In fact, the project, the budgeted amount per enrollee per month was exactly where we thought it would be. We got it wrong because the state survey miscounted the number of uninsured. There's too few uninsured. Okay? That said, let's stop and think about the numbers for a second. We're covering, I told you we're covering 450,000 new people with insurance at a cost of about a billion dollars. This is MIT. We can do in our heads see that's about $2,000 a person. Okay? That's a phenomenally low number. To spend $2,000 per person newly insured is phenomenally insured. Let me give you a comparison. The Medicare Part D program, it's a new program introduced in 2006 to provide drug benefits for seniors. That program spends $40 billion a year nationally and covers about 10 million, peop about 10 million people who have gained prescription drug coverage. So that's about $4,000 a person. So we're spending twice as much just to provide drug coverage to the elderly as Massachusetts is spending to provide the entire bundle of coverage to non elderly So this is a phenomenally low number, better than anybody ever could have projected for the cost. And the reason, there's no magic. The reason is this. It's that all these people are taking up where we don't have to pay anything. All these people are gaining coverage where it's not costing the state a penny. 
And that's why uh, the numbers look so good. So it's once again, it's the mandate that's key here. As I said, employer-sponsored insurance coverage is growing. One nice thing, public support is high and growing for this program. That was certainly a concern. It was a pretty radical departure from previous policy. And another nice feature is care to the uninsured is down. Sort of the notion was we could help pay for this by lowering what the state already spent on the uninsured. Uh, basically, the number of people getting free care at the hospital fell from 400,000 about 250,000 by the first quarter of 08, and the amount of money that hospitals uh, were spending on this fell almost in half. So uh, you do see reduction in free care. Okay, so that's sort of how the program's going, which I think is incredibly well. Now, John, what about cost control? Okay, we spend. 16%, I'm going to go back. We, we spent about 16% of our GDP on health care costs, at least about a, third more than, uh, about a third more than any other nation that's got a comparable system. Uh, and our outcomes don't seem so good. Uh, what about cost control? And the answer is, um, you know what? I, I don't know what to do about cost control. In fact, nobody really does. The point is, we have these two problems in America right now. One we know how to solve, and one we don't. We know how to cover the uninsured. I've just laid out one way. I could lay out six other ways. We actually don't know how to control costs, health care costs, in a politically feasible way. I mean, I know how to control health care costs. I can just tell people they can't get the health care they want. So to be easy to control health care costs, I could just announce we're not spending more than 16% of GNP ever again on health care. And what that means is, for example, you have to wait three months for an MRI. Uh, you can't have back surgery. You can't you're, get Viagra, et cetera. Okay? I could do that. We could do that. Uh, and it just is politically infeasible. The American health con consumer is not ready to be denied the things they want. And fundamental cost control is not about good sounding stuff like health IT and prevention and all the stuff that sounds great and win-win and all that crap. Okay? That's just nibbling around the edges. Fundamental cost control is about telling people they can't have stuff they want. And that's not going to happen in the U.S., not yet. Unlike single payer, I think it will happen but it's going to take a much more dire financial crisis for it to happen. I think we're at least 10 years away from having that conversation in a serious way. So the argument for, so my argument has been to not let comprehensive reform be the enemy of universal coverage. That's what we've done ev every decade we've tried to reform health care since 1950. Every decade what's killed health care reform is not the money it takes to cover the uninsured. What's killed health care reform is opposition to the cost control measures that were included in the bill. So let's get the uninsured covered. Let's take that moral imperative, and then let's worry about cost control. There's another actually interesting point that's been developed in my mind since we did in Massachusetts that I hadn't appreciated, which is a political argument for this position, which is, in fact, once you get everyone covered, you get the debate much more focused on cost control. So example here in Massachusetts, we have an incredibly powerful advocacy community here in Massachusetts, led by a group called Healthcare for All, an incredibly important and player in healthcare, and they've done a lot of wonderful things traditionally focused on expanding health insurance coverage. And they were a key reason we got this bill in 2006. Well, now they're saying, wait a second. We've got this coverage. It's great, but if we don't get health care costs under control, the whole thing's going to blow up. We've got to get health care costs under control. Suddenly, you've got everyone focused on the same thing. You don't have people running in different directions with different goals. Everyone's now focused on the same thing, which is how do we control health care costs. We haven't done it yet. We're not going to do it for a while. But let's do what we can do, and then let's worry about uh, what's, what's sort of down the road. Okay, presidential politics. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about, so let me get there. Two very, this is an incredibly exciting topic. This is, I would claim, the largest difference between two presidential candidates on a domestic issue in my lifetime. Okay? And what I mean by that is not that sort of, you know, they've had, people have had differences. They've said they want to privatize Social Security. Others have said they don't. Those are big differences. But in terms of specific plans laid out, the details have been laid out the fundamentally different vision for the healthcare system in America. These are unbelievably large gap between the two candidates. So let me go through what they're doing. The Obama plan is very much like the Massachusetts plan, but with no mandate. So it introduced subsidies for low-income people. He hasn't specified what they be, nor should he. It's a presidential campaign. You don't give details. But basically, it's subsidies for low-income people and a reform pool where people can come and get health insurance in a way which is not discriminated by, by health. So he's solving the affordability problem, he's solving the pooling problem. Okay? He does not have a mandate. He does have something called auto-enrollment, where if you're offered employer-provided insurance, we'll auto-enroll you in that insurance. But it does not have a mandate. Now, the interesting issue is, can a plan like this actually work without a mandate? Now, the one of you might think, okay, that's fine, it doesn't have a mandate. Best estimates are he'd cover about half the uninsured. 
That's a good first step. What's the problem? The only problem is trying to do the reform non-group market without a mandate, you could run to the Massachusetts problem. So once again, what happened in Massachusetts? We tried to reform the market, charge the sick and the healthy the same, and the price went through the roof and all the healthy dropped out. Will the same thing happen with Obama's plan? If he tries to charge the sick and healthy the same, will the healthy all drop out and the price go through the roof and only the sick be able to get health insurance? Now, it's less of a problem in Obama's case because he's also subsidizing the healthy somewhat to get the insurance. But without the mandate, it's not clear he can achieve that goal he wants to achieve. So I think that's the one sort of crucial missing piece. There's an enormous amount of enthusiasm actually for the mandate on the Senate side right now and the legislative side. So I think that is a part of his plan which will be strongly revisited. But basically, the fundamental idea is to do this incremental universal loans approach. Leave employer-sponsored insurance alone. Um, leave it alone. I'll augment it a bit, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but basically, build around the edges with new subsidies for low-income people in a reformed non-group market. And this costs 60 to $100 billion. He says 60. I think it's probably more like 100. Okay? Uh, the McCain plan. The McCain plan starts with a wonderful premise, near and dear to the heart health policy analysts, which is that the exclusion of employer-sponsored insurance from taxation. MIT right now, every year, spends about $10,000 on my family's health insurance. That's a form of compensation to me. I am $10,000 richer because MIT's done that. But I'm not taxed on that. If MIT gave me a $10,000 raise, I'd be taxed on it. But if MIT gives me $10,000 in health insurance, I'm not taxed on it. That's a $4,000 tax break that I, a rich guy, am getting for having health insurance from MIT. This is, this is a huge problem in the U.S. First of all, this tax break amounts to $250 billion a year. Okay? This is almost as large as the entire Medicaid program, okay, which gets a lot of attention. Second of all, it's regressive. The idea is since you're excluding compensation from taxation and tax rates rise with income, the richer you are, the bigger tax break you're getting. So there's a benefit which is worth more to the rich than it is to the poor. And obviously, if you don't pay taxes, it's worth nothing to you. As I said, about half the uninsured don't pay taxes. So most of the uninsured are getting nothing out of this tax. They have no opportunity to take advantage of this tax break. And finally, it's inefficient. This is my point about the gold-plated sinks on the boat. It causes people to buy health insurance that's too generous. And MIT, God bless them, has given me the best example of that this year. When I got my MIT benefits form this year, in the Delta Dental Plan, I had the opportunity to add orthodontia coverage for my kids. Actually, for everybody, but for the whole family. For $30 a month, I could add orthodontia coverage. Now, my son has braces, and it costs $22 a month. So I should have sat down and said, well, 22 bucks a month I'm paying, 30 bucks is higher than that, I shouldn't get insurance. But the 22 bucks I pay after tax, the $30 I get with tax break on. So actually, the $30 is only costing me $18 a month. So I took the health insurance. Okay? Now, once I have the health insurance, all bets are off. It's gold-plated braces. You know, because now it's free, right? If I want to get gold places braces before, I'd have to pay. Now MIT pays. So he's got the light-up braces. He doesn't really, but he could add the light-up braces and all that. He's got the green ones now. He gets the color change every few months. Okay? And basically, I am excessively, my family is excessively consuming braces because of this tax break. Okay? It's exactly an example of the problem that this is causing. There is no health analyst who does not want a job in the Obama administration who would tell you that if they were starting over, they would include this health tax break. Okay? This is a terrible feature of our system. If we could start over, no one would include it. However, we're not starting over. We have it now. And it's been put in place. And it's a different issue saying we wish this was never there versus getting rid of it. What McCain pro proposes is to get rid of this tax break and replace it with credits to individuals of $2,500 for, for an individual and $5,000 for a family. Okay? This is a great idea in many accounts. First of all, it would end the regressivity because everyone gets the same amount. And it would end the inefficiency because I get a flat amount just because I have health insurance. It wouldn't matter if I bought off an orthodontic coverage or not. So it's a great idea as far as it goes. The problem is if you get rid of this exclusion, then suddenly a lot of employers will decide not to offer health insurance anymore. And if they decide not to offer health insurance anymore, their sick employees are screwed. Because what McCain doesn't do is do anything to help out in the markets where people would take these credits. In fact, he makes it worse. He says that you could get this credit and it's going to let you shop across state lines for non-group insurance. What we have in America today is in about two-thirds of the states, non-group insurance is wild west. They can charge a healthy, a low price, and the sick, they can just say get lost. About one-third of the states, that's not the case. 
What McCain's bill would do is essentially make those one third of the states irrelevant because I just go by, if I'm healthy, I go by in, this, well, in the free states, and only the sick would buy in the other states. Essentially, would kill any regulation we now have of the non group market. So essentially, yes, a $5,000 credit's nice. But in fact, if I'm sick and I can't get health insurance, once again, 5, 000, infinity minus $5,000 is still infinity. Okay? So basically, it doesn't do any good uh, for the sick. Now, he has added this thing. Elizabeth Edwards did this wonderful thing. She wrote an editorial saying neither she nor John McCain would actually be able to get health insurance under his plan because they're cancer survivors. That's a pretty good point. So he added this feature, which are high-risk pools where the sick can buy health insurance, but they still have to pay an enormous premium. And these things have been put in place in states and not done very well. Okay? So that's sort of where we are on, uh, on the McCain and, 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 the, uh, and the Obama plans. Okay, how do we compare these? Well, they're fundamentally different visions along four dimensions. Okay? The first is who pays for the sick? Healthcare reform is about paying for the sick. Okay, who pays for the sick? Well, in the Obama plan, the government and the healthy pay for the sick. The government through these major new subsidies, which would cost maybe $100 billion a year, and the healthy would pay through market reform because if you were healthy and used to get this great deal of non-group insurance, now you're going to, to pay the average price. So just, you're essentially going to be cross-subsidizing the sick. On the McCain plan, the government pays a little bit because it's high risk pools, but basically the sick pay for the sick because he's not reforming the market. The sick still have to pay uh, a lot more uh, than the healthy. Okay? That's the first comparison. The second comparison is do we get, do we get to universal coverage or even have aspirations of doing so? Obama says, yes, he has aspirations of doing so, even though he won't. He at least has aspirations of doing so. By solving the affordability problem and solving the pooling problem, um, he solves what I call the inadequate attention problem because people are getting defaulted into health insurance at work. But he doesn't solve this fundamental free riding problem, which is I'm a healthy 25-year-old and I'm uninsured because why should I be insured? If I get by a car, I can go to the hospital. Otherwise, I'm fine. He doesn't solve that problem. That's what you need the mandate to solve. McCain doesn't really aspire to universal coverage. Okay? And this is, in some sense, really a nice difference because it becomes a voting issue. In some sense, there's no right answer about whether we should have universal coverage or not in America. I believe we should, but there are many people who are to believe we shouldn't. But at least now it's a clear difference on which one can vote about whether you think it's a high priority for the, federal go for the government to ensure universal coverage or not. That can lead you uh, which way uh, to think about this issue. Um, the third thing is, should we devote significant new federal resources to the uninsured? Obama says yes. He has major new subsidies to the uninsured. He says 60 billion, I say more like 100 billion uh, in, um, in money. Uh, McCain says, well, sort of not really, maybe, I don't know. Okay? So basically, he, um, he has these small new subsidies, but actually this point is completely wrong. This point, it's an old slide. It's become clear that actually McCain, sort of ironic, actually has a plan which will, which will dwarf and cost what Obama's will cost. And, if you think, and that's because McCain admitted recently that he was only going to take away part of the exclusion of health insurance from taxation. He was only going to take away the income tax part. So think about the math for a second. The typical individual plan for health insurance costs about $5,000. The typical individual faces an income tax rate of 15%. So McCain's going to, take, going to tax that individual about $750 more a year. But he's going to give him a $2,500 credit. That's nowhere close to break even. In fact, the best estimates of McCain's plan are it would cost about $200 billion a year. So McCain's spending actually dwarfs Obama's spending. It's sort of, a, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. You don't think of that as him being a big spending candidate. But in fact... And, you know, Obama has misleadingly been saying McCain's going to raise tax in the middle class. That's wrong. McCain's going to, it's a huge tax cut because you're getting this huge tax credit that offsets a relatively small tax increase. And virtually every American would make money off McCain's plan. The problem is someone's got to pay for that. So McCain's got about a $200 billion a year budget hole he's got to fill. Recently, his advisor suggested he might fill it by cutting Medicare and Medicaid. That didn't go over so well politically, so they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, <laughs> But the bottom line is, Obama is wrong. McCain has a probably bigger middle class tax cut than he does, than Obama does. Okay? On the other hand, McCain's wrong. He doesn't have a balanced budget plan. He has a huge hole. That's $200 billion a year he's got to fill. Finally, what about the future of employer-sponsored insurance? Employer-sponsored insurance is eroding. Over the last six years, employer -sponsored the percentage of the population covered by employer-sponsored insurance has fallen by about a percent a year. What are we going to do about this? Obama says, look, we need to maintain the strong role for employer-sponsored insurance. He wants to build around the existing system, and moreover, 
he wants to introduce what's called a pay or play plan where employers that don't provide health insurance would have to pay a payroll tax. Uh, you know, numbers usually thrown out there about 6% of payroll um, to sort of give an incentive for employers to offer health insurance. So he wants to, if anything, expand the base of employer-sponsored health insurance, or at least try to mitigate its erosion. McCain says, look, McCain's ending the employer exclusion. He's giving you a credit you can use anywhere you want. Clearly, that will erode employer-sponsored insurance. Now, on this one, we have to ask ourselves, why do we care? Let's say I told you that we woke up tomorrow and everyone in America who had employer-sponsored insurance, they got their insurance through a federal pool that didn't discriminate by, age or, by, 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 by even age or health and cost the same thing as employer-sponsored insurance. Why would we care? Now, you might say, oh, that's because employers aren't paying anymore. But you know what? Employers never pay. So I leave you with one economics lesson today. It's what economists know for sure, and we have to convince the rest of the world are, is it's your dollars that are paying for your health insurance, not your employer's dollars. If MIT stopped paying me health insurance, they wouldn't have the given me health insurance. They wouldn't, in the fullness of time, pay me $10,000 more. It's an unrefutable fact, theoretically, empirically, that the costs of health insurance are fully reflected in workers' compensation. So if tomorrow we ended up in a world, as, for instance, Ron Wyden, Senator Wyden has proposed in the bill he has before Congress, where every employer stopped health, offering health insurance and just cashed out their employees, you know what? It's not the end of the world. It's not clear why we need employers in this game. It's not clear it sort of makes sense. So this part doesn't bother me so much about the McCain plan. I think it's more of an ideological thing uh, that we can talk about. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is Obama's got a terrific plan that needs money. McCain's got a terrific source of money that needs a plan. Let's put them together. <laughs> right? Let's put them together. Let's take Obama's plan, let's add a mandate, because we should, and let's finance it by getting rid of the tax exclusion. Okay? We can have the ultimate system. In fact, I've estimated that we, if we got rid of the tax exclusion, we could have universal coverage in America, more generous than we have in Massachusetts, and have $50 billion a year left over to spend on wars or whatever we want to spend it on. Okay? So we could, if we got rid of this regressive system of tax subsidies, we could easily uh, cover everyone with health insurance and have money left over. Now, there's a slight wrinkle I didn't mention here, which is, by the way, this would be an enormous tax increase on everyone above median income in America. So that's a bit of a bullet I left off here. Uh, that's why I'm not a politician. Uh, but nonetheless, the point is that, we, that I'm upset that Obama is demagoguing McCain's use of the, getting rid of the tax exclusion because actually that's a useful financing device. It's just McCain did it the wrong way. He shouldn't have just done it by throwing it out and throwing people in this wild west market. He should have done it in the context of a more sensible plan like Obama's. So that's where I am, uh, and let me, uh, let me stop there now and uh, take your questions. It's perfectly clear. That's excellent. <laughs> I think you're supposed to come to the mic. Would you make a Would you make a comment about the Hillary Clinton plan? Oh, I love the Hillary Clinton plan. What can I say? The Hillary Clinton plan was the Massachusetts plan. Uh, the Hillary Clinton plan was Obama's plan plus a mandate, uh, and I think it was a better plan. Um, I think that a mandate is really a central part of doing fundamental health care reform. Um, I was surprised politically she did that. I think Obama was a lot smarter politically to not have a mandate, uh, at least in his proposal for the, for the election. Uh, but I do hope, I think these numbers from Massachusetts are it's gaining a lot of traction. I know that the folks in the Senate are working this are taking the mandate very seriously, and I hope that that will be part of a, a national debate. Yeah. About quality of care, do you, do you have any... Um, Views from this from this scheme about how a change of the kind you recommend would affect quality. I mean, quality is sort of orthogonal. This is sort of a separate issue. I mean, I think we can deal with quality. I think a lot of the quality problems have to do with being uninsured. So I think universal coverage would help with quality. But sort of quality for the insured is almost sort of a separate issue to this. And I think there's lots we can do. But I, and, and I think lots we should do, you know, fighting hospital-acquired infections is a no-brainer. Uh, I think clearly if we move to a more rational health IT system, that will improve healthcare quality. But the thing we've got to remember is it's not going to save money. It's going to add money. So I think it's money we should be adding. I think we, what's more important than our health, if we spend another percent of GDP and people don't die in the hospital from infections, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, but the, the problem is people tell you that health, you can have healthcare quality in the cheap, and that's not right. 
I think we should do a lot of healthcare quality improvements, but we've got to be prepared that uh, that's going to cost us more money. And we've got to be prepared to pay that. Yeah? Is either candidate addressing the issue that a lot of Americans uh, don't seek preventive health care and wait until they get really bad and then go to the emergency room and it's going to cost them more money? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, the primary source of that is being uninsured. So Kennedy Obama is addressing that more than McCain, although McCain would still cover a lot of the uninsured with his plan too. So that's, that's the main thing uh, uh, you know, that, that's causing that. Um, among the insured, I think there are some things we can do around the margin. Once again, it's almost separate from these plans, uh, that, you know, these kind of wellness programs. Um, and uh, there's a big interest now in what we call value-based insurance design, which is basically if you're, say, um, you, know, you have copayments for your drugs. If you're diabetic, we'll waive the copayments for your diabetes drugs to try to get people to comply, et cetera. I think those are great ideas, uh, but they're once again almost separate from this. Uh, and the truth is, any stuff like that, it doesn't matter who's going to get elected, whether it's going to get done or not. I mean, it's something, stuff that's good ideas to do, are they going to get done or not get done, but it's not going to be, you know, they're going to consult the same experts, whoever gets elected, and have the same proposals. And that's really not what this election is sort of about. This election is more about the vision of sort of covering the uninsured, not about the stuff on the margins on sort of quality or, or preventive care. Yeah. I think the uh, system of payment is completely distorted. When you pay people a fee for service, whether they're lawyers or doctors or plumbers, and I happen to be a lawyer, there's such an incentive to inflate and be dishonest. My wife and I get medical care <coughs> as under Medicare under the capitation program <coughs> in which uh, Medicare pays Harvard Vanguard or some related insurance companies a capitation of about $6,000 a year. And Harvard Vanguard people, their employees, are paid a salary, and we get the most fabulous medical care. And we do that because the people working for Harvard Vanguard are socially responsible. They look upon their, their service as a public service, and they're proud of the quality they provide. And I just don't understand why we can't have a universal system. I know everybody poo poos it, but other countries use it and it works goddamn well. We have friends in England who wouldn't leave England because of the service they get. And I think it's about time for people to promote this instead of throwing up their hands. And I think you ought to start. Okay. Well, I think, uh, I think you raised a lot of good issues there. Um, but you're mixing together a few issues, and I, th I, th I think you need to, uh, to keep them separate. First of all, the issue about how you get treated the doctor and capitation stuff, that's totally separate from single payer. We can do that in a multi-payer system. There's no reason why you have to go to single payer to get that. Okay? So I think that basically the mistake we make in America is looking at Canada as the model or England. Those aren't really the models we should look at. The models we should look at are Switzerland and the Netherlands, which are private systems with employer-sponsored health insurance, universal coverage, and they spend about two-thirds of what we do. That's where we should, now, maybe someday I'm wrong, and in 50 years we can look to Canada, but let's first look to places that do what we want to do and do it 50% more efficiently. That's where we ought to look, and a lot of it is through the kind of incentives that you mentioned. Capitation, non-fee-for-service. Look, fee-for-service is basically dead in America, in the medical sector. I don't know about the legal sector. Uh, but in the medical sector, fee-for-service is basically dead in America. Things are all, almost all on capitation basis, and um, it, the problem is it's still not good enough. The problem is that even on a capitation basis, the problem is that you do get wonderful health care. In some sense, that's the problem. You get too much health care. Most people, we have a problem in America. We have 47 million people not getting enough health care, and we have, a, and we have two, over 200 million people getting too much health care, and that's, a, that's why it's so expensive. Now, if, you're, if you want to pay for it and get a lot of health care, God bless you, you should be able to do that. But there's no reason why the government's tax dollars should subsidize people to get excessive health care. And that's exactly what we need to, that's what we're going to have to address if we fundamentally want to control health care costs. And your comments are exactly why it's going to be hard. Because you love your wonderful health care and you should love it. It's wonderful. Okay? But basically, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to get people to scale back on what they have. We saw this in Ireland. The government just proposed to end free health care and make elderly people pay a little for their health care. And these elderly people went nuts and started to charge the stage and almost killed the government employee. And it was like awful. And basically, people really feel it should all be free. They should get whatever they want. 
and that's the fundamental problem we have to face. Let me make one other international comparison point, because I think this is important. Your friend who's happy in England, God bless him, but he's completely wrong. Okay? Basically, if you are like us, rich, plugged in, there is indisputably no place better in the world to get healthcare than America. And there's a simple fact test of that that economists like to do, which is if it, was, if it wasn't the best, why would people spend, a, why would a hundred times as many dollars be spent coming into the U.S. to get health care as is spent leaving the U.S. to get health care? The U.S., if you're plugged in, if you're in the system, is indisputably the best health care in the world. It's not a third better. It's just a little bit better, but it's better. The problem is it's terrible if you're not plugged in. So that's why it's sort of unfair to say, well, the U.S. has terrible health care because we're, the poster said we're 37th infant mortality or whatever. That's irrelevant because infant mortality for me is the best in the world. The problem is an African-American child born in Washington, D.C. has the same chance of seeing their first birthday as one born in Barbados. Okay? That's the problem, and that drives our infant mortality statistics. So the notion the U.S. is paying more and getting worse, that's ridiculous. We're paying more, and we're getting more for people plugged in, and we're getting nothing for the people who aren't plugged in, and that's the real problem. I wonder if you could talk about the implication of so many people turning 65 and rolling on to Medicare, because I, if I, I think I understand that these numbers don't really count the Medicare numbers, right? They're a separate set of yeah, entitlements. Yeah, no, it's a separate. No, that's right. That's right. So I wondered how the, it would affect these numbers, of the plans that the candidates have. I mean, Medicare is the giant issue, and not because people are turning. Medicare is an issue partly because we're getting older. My favorite fact in this is by 2025, the percent of America that's over age 65 will be higher than the percent of Florida today that's over 65. So America's going to look like Florida in 17 years, okay? Um, and global warming may start to feel like Florida too. And basically, um, but you know what? It's really a trivial issue relative to the underlying cost growth of healthcare. If you do your best guess as to over the projected future, what the U.S. government has promised and what we intend to collect in taxes, we are $75 trillion short. That's trillion, okay? 62 trillion of that is Medicare. And of that 62 trillion, maybe it's a few trillion is people getting older. It's the cost of healthcare going up. So in other words, another way to think of this is if we want to stop the Medicare shortfall just over the next 75 years, the current payroll tax that's 2.9% of payroll would have to go up to about 14% of payroll, just for Medicare, not to mention the 13% we have for Social Security. Okay? And the problem is not those 365, it's this internal rise in healthcare costs. And that's going to be the crisis that finally drives us to do something about healthcare costs. It's when we literally have to raise tax rates enormously or the country has to go bankrupt. That's when, but you know, that's, we're, we're at least 10 years away from facing that crisis. Yeah. Could it be possible simply to remove the cap that is on, on uh, Medicare and, uh, and Social Security? So on the cap, on the 2.9% tax. Exactly. Yeah. Tax okay. Uh, we already, on Medicare, we already did that. So there's a payroll tax that we pay. It's 15.3%, 2.9%, well, you see 7.65, your employer pays 7.65. 1.45% on either side, okay, is for Medicare. That's uncapped. You pay on every dollar you earn. The rest is uh, Social Security and disability insurance. That is capped currently at about $95,000 a year. And one proposal you often hear is uncapping that. That would raise a little money, but, you know, to be honest, relative to the $75 tr trillion we're short, that would maybe raise a trillion. I mean, that's like, it's, it's, it's really a drop in the bucket. It would, it, 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 it's not, you know, I don't want to get to optimal tax theory. It's not necessarily move I'd support for other reasons. Uh, but I think that the point is, I, either way, it's not worth debating because it's not really big enough to, to deal with the germane issues. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you were just talking a little bit about the um, money where we're going to come up short for Medicare. And I know within the Medicare plan, when it reaches a level of unfundability, that it's required that the president respond um, with a plan to sort of fix the solvency of the program, which obviously falls into the lap of either Obama or McCain. But it's also been said that both of these plans that they've presented, neither one is going to come even close to solving those Medicare solvency issues. Um, and obviously, I think they're not presenting more right now because you also mentioned that it's sort of politically unfavorable to talk about some of these right. other issues that might help. So do you see any of them um, adopting bigger changes to their plans that they would never say before they're elected, but once they're in office, do you predict that they might change their plans in a certain way to fix that solvency issue? I mean, uh, it's a great question. I mean, Medicare is, the Medicare Trust Fund, which is how we pay for hospital care to Medicare, is supposed to run out of money around 2016, 2017. So it's at least not a first-term issue. But I'm not aware of any bill in the books that actually says they have to respond when that happens. 
Uh, it may be, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, they are, that may be the action forcing event, but until then, they're not doing anything. The, because the, nobody wants to get the elderly mad. You saw in Ireland what happens to try to make the elderly mad. In America, they don't like making the elderly mad either. So until that trust fund, so, the last time I faced a crisis like this was Social Security in 1983. The trust fund was six months away from running out of money before we finally did something about it. Okay, uh, so I think, and what we did about it was a problem that would solve, that was like 30 years off. Okay, in Medicare, we we'll have to do something way more dramatic. So I, I think it's gonna take, you know, we talk about global warming, can we address global warming? You know, the parallel here is we only did something about chlorofluorocarbons when a hole literally opened up in the ozone layer. Okay, we're going to need the equivalent of the hole in the ozone layer to actually get these candidates to talk seriously about Medicare. They're not saying anything about it, and they're not going to say anything about it until they absolutely have to. Yeah. Uh, you talked about insurance companies charging infinity if they want to sometimes and also rising costs. I want to understand what's the main market imperfection that's creating this? Is it imperfect competition, asymmetric information, or you know, what is it that we fundamentally would like to fix in, in, this, in this respect? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting question. It's not really a market imperfection, it's just a redistributional issue. In a, basically, okay, th th there's two different questions. One is why don't they charge the sick what they expect the sick to cost instead of infinity? So let's say uh, a healthy person costs $2,000 a year, a sick person costs 10000 Why don't they charge them 10000 instead of just denying them health insurance? 11. Or 11. And the answer is just a standard lemons problem. If you charge them 11, only people who are super sick will buy it. And, and the program will unravel, okay? So, so that's one problem. But you know, the fundamental issue is more an income redistribution problem, which is basically, we can solve that by just pooling everyone together. But that amounts to taxing the healthy to support the sick, and we've got to decide we want to make that redistributional step. We make, in employer-sponsored insurance, I mean, basically, my, my family is incredibly sick, and we've been massively cross-subsidized by their MIT employees for at least a decade, okay? <laughs> so basically, you know, most people are in employer-sponsored insurance plans, where that sort of cross-subsidization happens all the time. Uh, but we're going to have to make that cross-subsidization explicit, and there'll be a lot of young healthies uh, who won't like that. Now, I'm encouraged by the, in Massachusetts, we've done that. That's what our mandate's doing, and so far, we haven't had revolt in the street. Uh, but that's essentially what's going to have to happen. All right, thank you very much.